Hi, I'm Cheyenne. I'm a junior and I go to Frankfurt High School. And there are a lot of people here. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just gonna read um, a piece that I wrote and it's called I Freckle. I've learned to live with people always being in my face. The sour smell of their breath seeping into my nose, watching as their eyes look and search into mine to find you. Some even grab my face with their greasy hands in search of you, taking them only a few seconds to find you. Then the certain people who take so many minutes that basically feel like eternity. I've also learned to always look at the person's nose so it makes it easy for them to see you. Then I answer the basic questions before they can even ask me. I tell them that you could be the cause if I one day go blind or if I even die. My possible cancer, but you are beautiful. You have been growing up with me since I was a baby. My brown sectoral heterochroma. Being so rare that it only happens in animals, so only about 1% of the human population has sectoral heterochroma. It happens because of a genetic mutation in the iris that happened during my time in the womb. So in some ways, I guess you could call me a mutant. From a tiny speck to taking up almost half the color in my iris, yes, it does grow and will continue to grow until one day it will change the color of my iris completely. But so far, your beauty has also come with costs. From the thousands of eye doctors made just for you, I've watched you grow just as you have watched me. And we both have suffered through wandering eyes together, becoming the perfect team. Growing up with so many wandering eyes and being poked and prodded, we learned to get used to the feeling of having our eyes dilated. We complete each other because after all, we are stuck with each other. I've learned to live with you and have accepted you as a major part of my life. I just hope that one day you decide to not kill me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Olivia Schmitz. I am a senior from St. Francis High School for 10 more days. <laughs> and I will be reading two poems. Four-pronged friend. I thank the fork for keeping me fed, for nothing else is so versatile, works so nobly. From steak to pancakes, to carrots to pollock, you defy your foes with fervor, without complaint. You are the child's trident. You are the makeshift shovel. You are the unsung hero of our dining room table. The fork is a friend to civil folk who keep napkins on their laps and plates as a lake too large for a utensil to cross. The fork stands alone. The fork forges names in the fires of glory. The epithet Dinglehopper sits in the mouth of five-year-old awe. Your older brother was the constant companion of angry mob villager number four, as seen on TV, farms, and 18th century Salem. But your metal is smoother, and your purpose is kinder, and for that we are all thankful. The favorite. I am packed like a sardine between my siblings, old and new. We pass the time telling stories as we sit and wait for you. The others tell me they're jealous and that I am truly blessed. I get read by you the most and I know your hands the best. I know what bags you like, what items you always keep, and what brand of toothpaste you use before you go to sleep. I can tell you love a song by how loud you sing in the car, and I know you almost crashed while playing your air guitar. I recognize the salt of your tears from when that one character dies. Your laughter and your snore to me are like lullabies. Your love isn't without a cost. My face is bent, my spine is weak, I'm marred by crayon and pen, but I would take these wounds any day, my dear, to be read by you again. Thank you. It's me again, Anne. Um, hey, uh, I just want to give my heartfelt thanks to the sponsors, Cordia, uh, they're our sustaining sponsor, 
And if you haven't been over there, just check them out. It's a residential club for people 55 and up, and Andrea spoke there today. Uh, and it's kind of an everyday thing for authors, musicians, artists to be there. Today I saw um, three older gentlemen composing music together. Cool place. Um, and then Traverse City Eye is our season sponsor. Um, they are a great eye care center. They've been in business for decades. Um, Traverse City loves them. We go there and the staff could not be friendlier. Um, and then just one other thing is, uh, Horizon Books had the wonderful problem of a lot of people buying way more books than they anticipated. So if you wanna buy a book tonight and they run out, um, they're taking names and phone numbers and they'll give you a book plate for Andrea to sign so that you can have an autographed book. So uh, I was, I was kind of happy about the news and sort of anxious about it also. Um, Thanks to our supporting sponsors. Um, you can see them up on the screen and our media sponsors, which are really important to us, the Record Eagle, Northern Express, and Midwestern Broadcasting. So that's why you hear a lot of those messages, thanks to them. And, um, and, and many thanks to the Michigan, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, which has stayed alive and survived the budget process. Thanks to Marina Call and Cindy Weaver. That's the small but mighty staff at NWS and Cindy Weaver came despite just having knee surgery, so that's loyalty. And then um, a final thanks to our volunteers. Um, please take a bow, we could not do this without you. Um, so Andrea Peterson is a graduate of the University of Michigan, Go Blue. She worked on Capitol Hill before for beginning her 21 year career at the Wall Street Journal and I hope she talks about her first job, it's very funny. She checks out the competition every morning. Um, she uh, reports on psychology, health and neuroscience. She's a recipient of a Rosalind Carter Fellowship for Mental Health Journalism and she lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and daughter Fiona. Um, interviewing her is Morgan Springer and I know Probably all of you have heard Morgan Springer on IPR. Her stories um, have won awards. Um, she won a 2017 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for her story, Grandmother's Letter from the Holocaust, and her story, Behind Bars, Transformation Through Poetry, won a first place National PRNDI Award in the soft feature category last year. So it's my pleasure to bring them on the stage. Hi. It's so nice to be here. It's great to be here, too. Thank you so much for coming, and yeah. thanks, Anna, Doug, and everyone for supporting this. This has been it's a real treat. To... I know. And we're here to talk about your book, yes. On Edge, The Journey Through Anxiety, which is kind of a mix of a personal narrative about, obviously, your journey through anxiety. You go into a deep dive into the research on anxiety, treatment on anxiety. And I just want to dive right in and have you read the, in, the beginning of the book that talks about sure. your, um, your first panic attack. Okay. Can you do that? I will. Great. I'm a little anxious. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can admit that to you all yeah. now. So, do you know why? It's on what, the table. Right. Um, so I'm, this is from the prologue of the book, and it, it describes the moment when anxiety really became an occupying force in my life. Fear ambushes me. It's early on the morning of December 5th, 1989, at least early for a college student, which is what I am. A sophomore at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, a bucolic campus of creaky A-frame houses, earnest politics, fraternity sweatshirts, and dollar pitchers of beer. This was a long time ago, obviously. <laughs> Price of beer, I think, has gone a little bit up. I feel fine, groggy from a late night of studying, yes, Touched by a bit of that Midwestern late fall dread, anticipating another long winter of fierce winds and sleeping bag shaped coats. But I'm fine. And then, a second later, I'm not. 
A knot of fear erupts at the base of my spine and travels upward. My stomach flips and I break out in a thin film of sweat. My heart rate shoots up. I feel the erratic thump, thump banging against my ears, my stomach, my eyes. My breathing turns shallow and fast. Fuzzy gray blotches appear before my eyes. The letters before me warp, words dip and buckle. There's no warning, no prodrome. The onset is as sudden as a car crash. Something in my body or brain has gone dramatically and irrevocably wrong. My noisy internal monologue, usually flitting from school to boys to a laundry list of insecurities, coalesces around one certain refrain. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. I flee the building and somehow make it home, crawling into my bottom bunk in the room I share with two other girls. I hug my knees into my chest and huddle against the cinder block wall, my breathing still shallow, my heart still racing, the hot terror still there. Remarkably, it seems I'm alive. Any relief that gives me, however, is short-lived. If I'm not dying, I must be going crazy. Crazy like my grandmother. Like the woman who clutched knives and thought Catholics were trying to kill her. Like the woman who spent three years in a mental institution, had electroshock therapy, and tried to burn the house down with my nine-year-old father and his brother and sister in it. Like the woman who died in my grandfather's arms when I was two years old. She had suffered a heart attack but was too terrified to go with paramedics to the hospital. Crazy like that. So this experience was a panic attack. But, but you I didn't know it? No, I had no idea at the time. What did you think was happening? I thought I was dying. Right. I literally, I mean, I thought I was having a heart attack or some catastrophic organ failure. I, I really had no idea. I had no frame of reference for it. And then you say that it keeps happening. What's, what's the typical amount of time that a panic attack would last? Well, according to the DSM, which is the sort of diagnostic Bible that psychi psychologists and psych psychiatrists use to diagnose mental health disorders, a panic attack is supposed to peak within about 10 minutes and then abate. But for me, that, that uh, winter in college, it ushered in this period of almost a month that felt like pretty much a continual panic attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just had these intense physical sensations and this terror. And I was pretty much ended up marooned on my parents' sofa at their home in Okemos, Michigan, where I would finished high school. And um, I, you know, they, they took me to a doctor and the doctor checked me out and said that I had mitral valve prolapse, which is a kind of a fluttery heart valve, but it's generally benign. So that really didn't answer why I felt so terrible. And it really started this medical odyssey that took many doctors, I think I saw a dozen, you know, they took, they did tons of different tests, took a lot of blood, EKGs, um, MRIs, because I was having all sorts of other physical symptoms too. I was noticing, you know, my, my mouth would be numb, my feet would feel numb, um, I'd had all sorts of neurological symptoms, like it looked, almost felt like I was wearing someone else's prescription glasses, like the, the walls were kind of tilting at odd angles. And I ended up in the emergency room a couple of times thinking I was having a heart attack. One doctor actually fired me. He told me not to come back. He said, I don't know what to do with you, but don't come back. That's very helpful. <laughs> it was very, <laughs> very helpful. So um, finally, actually the, at the University of Michigan uh, Health Services, I finally ended up in the, in the office of a psychiatrist who, and I actually said to her, I said, I'm not leaving here until you help me. And I think she was, <laughs> she was a little taken aback. I was like, I, you know, you have to do something because I can't, can't keep living like this. And she said, I could prescribe you Prozac, which is, was an antidepressant that actually had only been introduced in the US three years before, or I can send you to the anxiety disorders clinic at the University of Michigan Hospital. And that was the first time anyone had said, the word anxiety to me. And you chose the second option, right? I did, I yep. did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how was that experience? So I, the, the two main treatments for anxiety disorders, they're actually the same 
they, they've been pretty much the same for about the past 50 years. But I chose to um, pursue cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a type of talk therapy. And um, the main component of it is something called exposure. And um, exposure is really not fun, because basically what you have to do is expose yourself to the very things that you're afraid of. So, you know, one of my, um, the main, one of the main components of my panic attacks was I would get very scared, like if, if my heart raced for any reason, even, you know, I ran or something, I would, I would get really nervous. And so my therapist had me run up a flight of stairs and actually welcome that feeling and do that over and over again. And then I had to run up two flights of stairs. And the whole, the point of this is to basically convince yourself that whatever, you know, this, these catastrophic thoughts that you're having, whatever you think is, is, you know, could happen, won't. And so as the evidence builds that the, those, those thoughts are, are irrational, um, you know, the, the sort of rational, logical thoughts get a little sturdier. And so that did help a lot. And, and it helped for a couple of years, right? Yeah, I did. I mean, I was, I, I, it took, because, because it took me so long to be diagnosed, I had a lot of what's called avoidance behaviors, which is something that often happens with anxiety disorders, is that, you know, say I had a panic attack in line at a coffee shop. Well, the next time I might not be willing to stand in line or go to a coffee shop because I was associating that feeling with, with that place. You know, and, and so I started that had, then I started not wanting to go to movies because I, I started feeling panic at movies. And then I wouldn't go to Michigan football games because that made me feel panicky. So my world actually got smaller and smaller. And um, that is actually associated with heart, more chronic and harder to treat illnesses. So it took a while for that to kind of unravel, but I was in a much better place um, after, after the cognitive behavioral therapy. And you were still in college at that time. Did you I was. try? Did you try to hide it at all, or? Oh yes, with your friends. Well, for the first year, I didn't know what was wrong with me. Right. So I actually um, I had to come up with some kind of cover story because you know it didn't it didn't make sense why a college student was not going out. Not, I wasn't you know going to parties or going to bars. I was just pretty much. Um, it was because anxiety also can be very exhausting too. You know, just having your body this, on this constant high alert. I was I was wiped out. I was going to bed at eight o'clock at night. I hadn't done that since like third grade. So, um, what was your cover story? I, I told people I had mono. Yeah, like that's <laughs> like you know the quintessential college kissing disease. I figured you know, that was because I really did because I, I had I didn't know what to tell them. So I, that's what I that was my that was my cover story, and I stuck to it. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm recovering from that. And then was, when I was finally diagnosed, I um, I didn't really share much about it. Um, I was I guess I didn't I didn't know anyone who saw a therapist or were taking was taking any medication for a psych, uh, psychological illness. So to me, it, it just, I, I was, um, I, yeah, I just, I just kind of tried to fake it too. And, and that was exhausting as well because, you know, we try to have normal conversations with friends about, you know, whatever boy they're interested in or, about, you know, about, or try to study. And I could do that, but only about 10% of my brain was really focused on that. And the other sort of 80 to 90% was focused on worrying about, you know, I'll, I'll just you name it, anything, <laughs> and um, so that that was it was hard to sort of maintain that facade of being okay. Right. Um, in your book, you seem to have a sense of humor retrospectively about your panic attacks, like you. Um, You'll talk about the panic attacks happening. You know, you're, maybe you're sitting there eating or you're hiking, um, and then suddenly you're having kind of Ill, what you will say are illogical, catastrophic thoughts, like I'm dying, right. I'm having a heart attack, I have a brain tumor, whatever it might be. I'm curious to know if over time, after having many panic attacks, does that thinking change in the moment? Are you able to say, oh, this is just a panic attack, or does it? Is it still there? I mean, the, the, the frustrating thing about panic attacks is that they don't ever really get easier. I mean, I, in the moment, they're so uh, 
dramatic and intense that even though I've had you know, a ton before, there's, there's this one seed of doubt, like, oh, maybe this time this really is something bad. Um, and so I better you know, walk and like walk back and forth in front of the emergency room. That was uh, during a period of time I had a sort of relapse. I was sort of this constant visitor at this. I didn't actually usually go into the emergency room. I was just sort of like this funny, you know, this girl <laughs> sort of skulking around, walking back and forth in front of this emergency room. I don't know what people thought, but um, but it made you feel better. It made me feel better because I mean, like I knew, you know, and, and, and you know, sure enough, eventually the the, the feeling would would pass. Um, I mean, I did have, there was one, I was writing after 9-11, um, I was in New York during 9-11, and then afterwards, um, I don't know if people remember the anthrax attacks, um, so that, which I feel like is a story that's just tailor-made to unhinge an anxious person. I mean, you have this, you know, white, you know, some faceless assailant sending this white powder through the mail that is lethal if you inhale it. And of course, my editors in their deep wisdom decided to, that I was the perfect person to um, cover this story. And I, I hadn't been open about my anxiety to them, so I can't really blame them for it. But so yeah, so I find myself out in front of this, um, this uh, post office where these letter, anthrax lace letters had gone through. And I, you know, so, so people from the, the, um, the head of the post office would come out periodically and give us an update about what they had, the new developments they had found in the, in the you know, in the story. And, and uh, the, the story gets even more absurd because I, there was a 7-Eleven across the street and I had went and got a bottle of Gatorade and I put it in my bag and I must not have screwed the, cap on tightly enough, and so the Gatorade just spilled all over my purse, like, and completely killed my phone. Like, I, I pulled my phone out, and this was like an old Nokia phone, and there was a little, like, slosh of orange Gatorade, like, in the, in the screen. It looked like a lava lamp. <laughs> And it was just totally dead. So that, so, so not only am I writing about anthrax and you know all that, but I'm, I'm having to run across this major highway um, to dictate, to use a payphone to dictate my story to my editor in New York. And anyway, so this, this, this story, you know, writing about anthrax, and I just, and also I, I have a hard time driving on interstates. That's. And so I was driving all, and anyway, so, so it kind of culminated in this major panic attack. I was driving late at night, and um, I saw, as I, I started having a panic attack, I started, you know, I, get, I got short of breath, I felt like I couldn't breathe, and I saw a hospital, a sign for a hospital. And so I just turned off, went to the ER, just dropped my car off, mm -hmm. and walked in, and I told the nurse, I said, I have anthrax. <laughs> I, mean, I think I really said I've been writing about anthrax, but I think, or I don't know, it came out. And so she freaked out <laughs> and threw me out of the emergency room. <laughs> Because, I mean, it was highly contagious. And she said, wait, you have anthrax? Like, you have to get out of here. So I'm dumped, so I'm, so I'm you know, dumped onto the, they, they, they kick me out onto the, um, the driveway. And I'm standing there, and I'm starting to feel so ridiculous. Because, I mean, then I start thinking logically, OK, yes, I've, I've been writing about anthrax. Um, I haven't touched anybody that, I haven't touched a letter that has had anthrax. I haven't even been inside the facility that had the anthrax lace letters. I haven't touched anybody who's touched any of these anthrax lace letters. There's no way I could have anthrax, but I'm just freaked out about the idea of having anthrax. So, but then an ambulance comes up and there's a guy in an orange hazmat suit comes out of the, out of the ambulance to tell him, okay, I'm sorry, I, I've been writing about anthrax, I don't actually have anthrax. <laughs> and I swear, he looks at me and he just, he like rolls his eyes. <laughs> and he gets back in his ambulance and goes away. 
then, and then I just, I, I, I think I just like skulked away at that point. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting out of here. This is, I'm, this is like the nadir of embarrassment. And yeah. So he's rolling his eyes. Do you, right, do yeah. you have, do you feel like you were taken seriously when you would go in for panic attacks or when you um, go see doctors, did they take it yeah. seriously? Yeah. Um, I mean, well, well I, I had a, a kind of a weird road because I, as I, when I, when it took me the year to be before I was diagnosed, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think doctors were looking for other things. It just wasn't on top of mind. I'd like to think that that's changed now. That I think there, I do think that there's much more awareness about mental health issues, and I would be hopeful that um, you know someone who had that experience now wouldn't wouldn't have to have gone through that kind of medical odyssey that I did. That they would, you know, that, that a doctor would identify it um, because you know I had pretty classic panic attack symptoms. Like if you look at the DSM, it's like oh yeah, you know, I've got one through ten or whatever, um, but. But I, yeah, but now actually how it's really important for me because my anxiety is so physical to have a really solid relationship with my prim primary care doctor who knows about my anxiety and she has a really great way. I mean, she doesn't, she's not an alarmist um, in terms of, you know, always sending me if, if I have some strange new symptom, you know, sending me to another a specialist. But at the same time, she's also not, doesn't chalk everything up to my anxiety. It doesn't automatically think, oh, it's all in your head, you know, you're fine. Um, so it, it, that's been, it's been really important for me to find somebody who can, can really walk that fine line mm -hmm. with me. Do you feel like there are ways that um, your day-to-day -day life still now is, is changed because of your anxiety than maybe the average person? I don't know if it's the right way to say it, the average person, but. You know, it's hard. I mean, well, first of all, anxiety, and you know, what is anxiety anyway? I mean, I mean um, because I think we, and to me, the, and I've looked at all different definitions um, from various people, but the one that really resonates with me is one that a scientist at NIME, the National Institute of Mental Health, um, told me, and he said, anxiety is the anticipation of pain. It could be emotional pain, it could be physical pain, but it's about this sort of vague uncertainty, this, this um, of something, terrible happening in the future, but not necessarily knowing exactly what it is. And that, that kind of really um, was kind of, it's, and so, and a certain amount of anxiety is actually a good thing. I mean, it helps, it's motivating, it helps us study for tests and prepare for presentations and prepare for retirement and go to the doctor if we see, feel funny, but then at a certain point it becomes impairing and it becomes a disorder. And for me, um, you know, I have easy years and tough years. So this is, it's, I'm sorry, I'm taking a no, long no, meandering no, no. path of answering your question. But, um, you know, in tough years, anxiety is much, much more um, prominent. And it, it really it affects the way I work, you know, affects my work, it affects my um, relationships and, and, and uh, in, a, in a more intense way. Um, and in easy years, you know, it's, I still feel like I have to be vigilant, you know, in terms of, um, I, you know, I, I have to make sure I sleep eight hours a night because for me, um, I really feel like if I don't get enough sleep, that, that um, you know, I, then that, that can put me in the danger zone of, of making anxiety a little bit more prominent. Um, you know, exercise, like all these boring adult things that we're all supposed to do. We all know what we're supposed to do, but I feel like for people with anxiety, the, the, you know, the, they're even more critical because just the room for error um, when it comes to things like that is just a lot slimmer. So it depends where you're at. It depends on where I'm at, sort of in the cycle. Yeah. Um, but it's hard for me, you know, I've been, I, you know, I'm never gonna be a, no matter, first of all, I don't expect to be cured because I, I know this is a chronic illness. It's something I've grappled with with a long time. Um, but also it's hard, you know, I've, I've always, I've often asked myself this question, like if I could, you know, wave a magic wand and will my anxiety away, would I do that? And I've sort of, you know, after, even after doing all this research for the book, I, I can't answer that question because it's, too ingrained in, it's, it's just you. too, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's too, I, I, I'm kind of too close. I mean, anxiety and I are like too tightly bound at this point. It's just weird. Um, it's just, just, just too intense of a, of a relationship, I think. And I, I don't think I could tell, you know, of, if anxiety has taken away, um, you know, certain experiences. I'll never go skydiving. My dad actually did today at noon, and I was anxious about that all day. Like, 
<laughs> please, mom, text me and tell me he's alive and he's fine. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but also that the, the things that actually anxiety has given me, because there are some tremendous upsides to it. Believe it or not, there, it's true. Um, you, um, I think in the book you mentioned that for some people as they get older, anxiety does diminish. Is that true? Right. The, yeah, it's interesting. I talked to this um, the kind of the country's foremost epidemi met, met, mental health epidemiologist, and he did tell me that you know anxiety um, rates of anxiety disorders do tend to dip after age fifty. So I'm actually really looking forward to my fiftieth <laughs> birthday <laughs> um, because that. And and I asked him. I said, Well, why is that? And he said, Actually, you know, because. Um, anxiety, you know, your, your body's sort of on high alert. And he said, you know, you can't sort of stay that kind of amped up, you know, for your whole life. Like at some point it just kind of burns out. So I'm, I'm really waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that anxiety affects relationships. I'm wondering if you can yeah. talk about how it's affected your close relationships. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's, it's, I, anxiety has, well, there's some interesting statistics and they're um, a little depressing, but um, you know, anxious people are much less likely to marry and they're, if they do, they're much more likely to divorce. Um, and there's definite, and it seems to be there's, there's that, that anxiety stresses relationships and then also troubled relationships fuel anxiety. So, um, and personally, I, what I've found, I mean, and there is something called um, what psychologists call emotional contagion, where we actually, um, you know, that the, the anxiety is catching, and um, it's based on this knowledge that when that we actually mimic the facial expressions of other people. So if you if someone is looking anxious, you know, you will mimic that expression, and then often that and actually having that expression can induce that emotion. And there was actually really interesting studies that showed that it had, these researchers had um, two people, one person do a stress, put it, be put in a stressful situation, like take some uh, difficult math, do some difficult math problems, or uh, do a, a, a speech in front of a group of people. And they had observers watch them. And so the, the people who were doing this stressful, like having the stressful experiences, you know, their levels of stress hormones, like cortisol, went up, which you would imagine that they would. But the people who watched them, their stress hormones went up too. And if it was the romantic partner of the person who was doing the stressful experiences, their cortisol le levels really shot up. So we can um, actually, you know, anxiety is catching. And so what I've found is that some people don't want to catch what I have. So, um, and you know, I, there, I, there, I did lose one friend, I think, over, uh, um, I had a panic attack, and I just think she was freaked out by it. And then I had a relationship um, with, I had a boyfriend who just really could not deal with my anxiety. Like, I felt like every time I had a panic attack, he would just retreat further, and I think, Part of it was he, he just was deeply uncomfortable with the experience of anxiety, and then also I think he was worried that perhaps like some like that that um, you know sometimes when anxiety is really uh, you know my anxiety is really severe you know my life can get a little bit more constrained and you know I just can't do as many things and that can be a drag and then and I I think he was worried that his maybe life was going to get as constricted as he thought mine was. So, so actually, um, after that relationship ended, I made it a policy to tell every man I dated, no later than the second date, about my anxiety. I treated it like having a communicable disease or something. <laughs> um, and I, and I, you know, I said, and I, and I, you know, I told people that you know, this, this is this, this, you know, about my college kind of break down, for lack of a better word, and that this has been a chronic illness, and I have easy years, and I have tough years, and this is how I deal with it. And thankfully, when I met my husband, um, and I told him this, he was totally fine with it. And yeah. And you have a daughter. Um, how old is she? She just turned eight. Okay. And do you talk to her about anxiety? And yeah. what, what do you say to her? 
Well, she knows I've been working on this book. Yeah. She's actually really ready. For, she was very ready for me to be done with it because um, it was really intruding into our playtime together. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, we talk about, um, you know, she knows that I'm working on a book about anxiety and, you know, being nervous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she uh, understands that, that emotion. I mean, she, I mean, she was actually telling me recently that she said, Mama, I, you know, whenever I go to a birthday party, I get, I, you know, I, I, my, my tummy feels funny. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm excited, but I'm also, I'm also nervous. And so I'm like, yeah, so we, we talk about that, yeah. You talk about in your book how there's a genetic link right. with anxiety, yes. how if you have family members who have a, a mental illness, yeah. you're five times more likely to have some sort of mental illness or anxiety. Is that correct? It's, yes. If so, so if you have a first degree relative, a parent or a sibling or a child with an anxiety disorder, your risk of having one yourself is five times that of the general population. So it's a significant um, component of the risk factor is a genetic one. So yeah, so I do worry that my daughter will will struggle um, as well. And you know, I probably am a little bit too vigilant about. Okay, well, what does this mean? You know, she's mm -hmm. you know she's. Are oh, you she, analyzing it? Yeah, a little bit. Probably. Yeah, I try not Applying to. Applying the research. <laughs> it's right. Well, because there is research um, actually. It's fascinating they're, they're, you know, that they're able to identify children at risk of, of anxiety disorders as early as four months old. Mm -hmm. There's actually a, um, a temperament called um, high reactive temperament. And what it is is they, they, and they, they put these poor little babies in these battery of tests where they put a, a, um, a cotton swab filled with al alcohol under their nose and, and like these creepy looking toys in front of their faces and strange noises. And it's, it's basically testing how these babies react to novelty. And so babies who are highly reactive, that means that they, you know, they thrash their arms and they, they just, you know, they're, they're pissed off about this, about these, um, these, these new things. And those children tend to um, develop into behaviorally inhibited toddlers and behavioral inhibition. It's just uh, toddlers who are very shy and socially reticent. And those kids have a much higher likely of then developing anxiety disorders by adolescence. And so there's, um, you know, there's there's some efforts to identify these kids early, and then also actually to intervene and try to prevent anxiety disorders in these children. So that's some of the research that I'm actually, you know, as I was doing this book, was was really excited about. And I and I I've actually tried to apply some of those strategies with my own daughter. Yeah. The, you also talk about a, a link between gender and anxiety. Yeah. That mm -hmm. forty percent, forty percent of American women will have some sort of anxiety disorder in during their, their lifetime. lifetime. That's right. Mm -hmm. And there's a connection there to parenting, right? Right. There is. Yes. I mean, it's interesting because there's some evidence that um, that the part of the difference maybe may be because of hormones um, uh, that you know, fluctuating levels of estrogen in women um, mm -hmm. may account for some of the reasons why women tend to have uh, more issues with anxiety. But a lot of it, the research is really looking at how boys and girls are uh, raised. And um, you know, there's a lot of studies showing that um, when boys assert themselves, they are uh, encouraged to be independent, where girls are much more likely to be discouraged from that. There was actually a series of studies where children were um, invited to make a world with these sand toys, and they and their parents were involved and in, were helping them with it. And so when the boys asserted their independence, you know, they were moving the pieces around. Um, Parents tended to tended to, to uh, encourage that, but when girls did that, parents tended to talk over them, uh, just, and or just ignore what they were what they were doing. And so the message that sends is, you know, you're not really in control of your environment. And there's another interesting group of research by some Canadian researchers who actually were looking at how children and parents interact on the playground. And they had these were preschoolers, and they had them. Uh, play on a jungle gym and slide, and um, they had them sliding down this firehouse pole. And what they found is that you know, boys were much more encouraged to be to you know try these things and be independent, and girls were much more um, told to be careful and and really uh, 
told about safety. And actually, and so the parents actually had to teach the kids how to go down to this firehouse pole. And um, these, when parents tended to encourage their boys to go down independently, and, but they were much more likely to, and even though boys and girls were, were just as skilled at, at navigating this playground equipment, they, they would, parents would much more often actually help, physically help the girls, even if, when the girls didn't ask for help. And even when the boys asked for help, they said no. They told, and I'm like, no, you go off and do it, to the point where several boys actually tumbled onto the ground <laughs> because they, they uh, so, so, it's, and so the message that this researcher was saying, it, it can send, is that the world is a dangerous place and that um, you, know, you can't really navigate it on your own. And th th those sort of messages can, can fuel anxiety. And is the way to kind of, the solution to that for parents to unlearn that kind of gender-based parenting? I mean, that would be, I mean, I think encouraging bravery in girls, yeah. I mean, I think that's, I mean, it's not like, I mean, I, I struggle with that myself, too, because when, when you see your kid doing something potentially dangerous, you know, your, your impulse is to, but yeah, trying to sort of step back up, up on that a little bit. We have a halftime show, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, we have a hearsay storyteller who's going to come out. Um, hearsay is a, it's a live local storytelling event that happens every month. And our storyteller tonight is Elon Cameron. She's a Traverse City resident, an acupuncturist. She's right there. Um, and she's also in the process of putting her stories into a book. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. And I would like to just thank the National Writer Series. This is such a great thing that we have in this amazing town of ours. Um, on a sunny summer afternoon, I sent the following text out, of, out to a group of our friends. I hear there's a storm coming, but let's have a barbecue. <laughs> Unless the storm's really bad. Those long, yawning days of sunshine and beach time, and all the stuff that we have to do despite the fact that we live in a tourist town and are surrounded by people who are on vacation. That feeling of pressure every moment that we are away from work to make the most of the day. It's like a race from May to October. <laughs> Soak up as much summer as you can. <laughs> Have the most fun available, perhaps an advanced form of fear of missing out caused by being around people who are actually having a much better time than we are. <laughs> it's okay though, I'm used to that. I've had an anxiety disorder pretty much my whole life. Uh, when I was young, I was put into special ed classes because I couldn't sit still. My first grade teacher would remove her polyester belt from her handsome jumper and tie me to my chair how that may have informed my sexual proclivities as an adult is a story for another day. But that really happened at Oak Park Elementary School. I didn't know I was anxious. I didn't know what that word meant. It was the 1980s and people couldn't even discuss quiche without bringing up gender politics. So they put me in special ed. It didn't help my anxiety. I spent my days doing little mazes, which I found kind of easy and boring, and it gave the other kids a lot of reasons to make fun of me. At that time, I wasn't diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. I didn't have panic disorder, PTSD, major depressive episodes, and though the features and symptoms of each of those things crafted my experience of every day, I also wasn't diagnosed with attention deficit disorder or dyslexia yet. A clarity of why I'd done so poorly in school is actually the least of what those things taught me about myself when I learned them. My diagnosis at age seven was minimal brain damage. I learned to live with anxiety. Adolescence was rough. <laughs> But once I was in my teens, I made art, practiced martial arts, and kept to my very safe group of friends who had enough tolerance to deal with my quirky, eccentric anxiety to stick around. And I don't know who to credit for my stalwart fortitude or just dumbass stubbornness, probably my German ancestors. 
Living with anxiety is an adventure. I learned to joke about it. Anxiety is the spice of life, as I bopped around from psychiatrist to psychiatrist in my 20s, taking medications that were terribly expensive and ridiculously unhelpful, except for the weird metallic cabbage breath. That was like a favorite side effect of mine. I eventually found a therapist, a sliding scale therapist, who agreed to see me. And I saw her every week for 10 years. I know it's so rookie ther therapy to be all like, well, my therapist said this amazing thing, and she challenged me to do this new thing. And, and if that's annoying to you, you probably need some therapy. <laughs> And I really don't care, because Jody Michael saved my life. She was the first person who ever saw me have a panic attack and knew what it was. She was able to tell me what was happening. I didn't know much about what caused some of the symptoms that seemed to make me not just the base level of like anxious and weird that I am today, but a super bonus level of anxious and weird that I was back then. <laughs> I lived in a state of hypervigilance, which is an enhanced state of sensory sensitivity accompanied by an exaggerated intensity of behaviors whose purpose is to detect threat. <sighs> I was kind of fascinated by that. Hypervigilance is also often accompanied by a state of heightened anxiety, which can cause exhaustion. When I learned this term, I was really surprised there wasn't a picture of me in the book. <laughs> Example, Elon Cameron. I like to call it hyper village dance though. It sounds so much more fun and social. <laughs> uh, my brilliant therapist challenged me to use it in more interesting ways. So I started keeping a journal. I would write down everything I knew about everyone I encountered in every day of my life. If I had met you at an earlier time in my life, I would be able to tell you every single outfit you'd ever worn that I'd seen in chronological order. Way to make friends. <laughs> Not creepy at all. <laughs> I can't help it, I'm an only child. I remember having an anxiety attack in high school during a standardized test, one of those number two pencil deals with the bubbles, and all I could do was continue to work out some kind of semblance of a pattern because I believed that that was giving order to the known universe. I was sweating and thirsty and I couldn't see. One of my particularly fun anxiety things is I get double vision. Um, so the anxiety attacks at that age hit me so hard, I really didn't have any coping skills as a teenager. And growing up in Traverse City with a lot of friends who were very, 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 very religious, mostly Christian, um, I had this underlying question, which was, could it possibly be that I was evil or possessed or maybe Satan was coming for me? And uh, that wasn't great. It wasn't really helpful because I was raised by an agnostic and an atheist who were like, that's bull monotheism. And I was like, yeah, but what do I say when Satan comes for my soul, mom? <laughs> Still, right? <laughs> no, anyway. Working to live with anxiety has been like taming a wild, giant creature, I assume. I've never done that, despite my childhood fascination with grizzly atoms. I didn't really bite that much off with regard to taming wild creatures. But I would argue that if tended to and cared for, perhaps it can also give you strengths. Taming the beast is so annoyingly grown up. It's things like drinking enough water, getting really good sleep, eating right, exercising, having sunshine on our skin, taking time to study and be quiet and write. And at different times in my life, it's been necessary to have pharmaceutical intervention. I take really good care of the grizzly bear because I know it could kill me. 
I feel like anxiety is a person you have to deal with, someone you know but you totally hate. And you slowly get to know them better, so you kind of hate them less. But you have to deal with them every day. <laughs> Even when they criticize your every move, every outfit, every thought, every utterance. So back to that sunny summer day. Jen and I had both been working a lot, not taking enough time for summer or ourselves, and feeling that familiar sense that everyone else's lives were significantly better than ours. Our way of coping was to just have a big party. We decided to pull out all the stops. We were gonna grill for a small army. We had a selection of beverages that covered all of the summer cocktail trends. We had a plan for preparation. As soon as we got home, I'd start massaging the kale and she'd work on beverage service. We had it all set out. We hauled our cart to our 15-year-old car in the parking lot and started to load it up. In the short span of minutes, though, the sky flashed dark, like dusk in the afternoon. A chill accompanied the brisk wind and picked up quickly. I snapped a picture of the sky because I'd never really seen clouds like that, like a giant layered cake just kind of collapsing on itself in the middle. It became clear that we needed to move quickly, though. So we hopped in the car, urgency upon us, aware that this storm could be major. Not even a mile from the storm, sirens started going, they hit the fan. There were fire trucks everywhere blocking intersections so we couldn't go further. We crossed town as we were able and had to redirect several times because of fallen trees blocking our passage. We slowly made our way to Garfield. The wind was dumping rain in buckets the wipers had no chance to keep up with. Finally, we were closer, almost three miles from home. And just then, there was a clap flash, lightning, thunder, and it hit an electrical major kind of thing that initially looked like it was gonna just throw sparks into the sky, but actually then fell on a car in an intersection. It was one of those moments where you just take a pause. Jen made a U-turn, backtracking several blocks to find another way. She also started doing this really interesting kind of prayer screaming thing that I'd never witnessed where she was like, dear Lord Jesus, please help us. Oh my God, please get us home. Her whole body was shaking and she was operating the gas pedal as if it was part of the pump organ. <laughs> you sound awfully religious right now, I said. She didn't think that was funny. We took a turn and trees were literally flying by our field of vision like the Wizard of Oz. What's happening for me, though, in this moment is oddly different than what Jen's experiencing. I shift into this weird zen-like state where I'm completely calm because I realize if I start screaming, I'm going to terrify the beast who's driving the car. <laughs> And then I download this crazy map, which actually has like a you are here pin on it, and a series of different routes to our home that are color coded based on safety. Thank you. I could tell that yelling wasn't gonna work, so I got really calm and quiet and I explained that we will get home if you listen to everything I say and you do exactly as I say. And Jen was like, yes, pumping the... I was like, okay, squeeze your butt cheeks. Because I knew that she needed to start coursing the adrenaline through her body, and the only way to do that is start using major muscle groups. So I'm like, you need to breathe deeper, intense major muscle groups. And she's like, oh, hey, Jesus, please help us. So we turned down many side streets, covered with limbs and branches, major trees down. I could guide a gen around them, and we were almost able to cross the place that would lead us to the street we lived on. And then we came to a screeching halt, 
as a giant oak tree literally fell before us and bounced. It was one of those moments where you're just like a giant just happened in front of you. You never thought that was possible. And it was about four or five feet from the front door of a house that it fell in front of who had a beautiful garden. They had all these irises that they'd clearly planted right there. And Jen said, I can't go that way because of the flowers. <laughs> I was like, you have to drive that way. They can get more flowers. There are no getting more of us. We got to the other side of the huge tree, and then we saw it. There were electrical wires. And I made a decision based on my momentary drill sergeant clarity, which was, we're going to keep driving. And we did. And that was probably the fastest quarter mile that we drove in our entire time on the way home. We got to the other side of that. There were limbs and debris everywhere. We saw houses that had roofs caved in. We saw cars that were completely destroyed by the crashes of giant trees falling on them. We saw abandoned cars that were left on the road as we got there. And when we finally got to our driveway, it was blocked. We couldn't quite see our house from there, but I could tell a huge tree had fallen. It was one of those things where I was like, oh, there's a tree on our deck. Wait, that's not like an ornamental tree. Oh, that's like a 50-year-old maple tree. Oh, that broke some things. The power was out. But we had food. We could grill. We had a cooler full of ice. <laughs> and the ability to save some of the stuff in our fridge. We were both so shaken, though. We sent photos of our tree on our deck and said barbecue off <laughs> I don't really know what gave me the ability to be calm in that situation maybe it was the sheer necessity and human instinct I have to think that perhaps also it was my several decades of constantly preparing for ruin and disaster every day is the function of all my sleepless nights and sweaty handed days Maybe the payoff of years of fearful thinking and somehow surviving anyway. I'm not trying to polish a turd here. Having anxiety is not awesome. <laughs> it doesn't make you better, but maybe, maybe it can save your life. And it will inform some deep, animal survival instinct within you in a way that makes you mighty and strong like a giant wild creature. If you have anxiety or any of the delightful diagnoses I've mentioned here, you are not alone. You don't have to be alone with the suffering. There is help. I feel like Grizzly Adams sometimes sitting there with my evening tea while this giant, dangerous beast snoozes at my feet. But at least the thing sleeps now. Thank you. I heard a version of that story before I came out here, and I, I was igniting my major muscle groups before we came out tonight, <laughs> and it helped. Should we do all just some little isometrics? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So you, you can relate to that feeling, right, yeah. of being very calm in, in moments of crisis. Right. I, yeah, I find real peril actually galvanizes me. Yeah. Um, because the thing is, anxiety, it, you know, it's a, it's a future-oriented state. It's just, it's the you know, anticipation of these terrible things. But like Elon was saying, it, you know, when actual faced with something concrete that people, anxious people get stuff done. Um, and, you know, I found, I mean, because the thing is, you know, some, something terrible is bound to happen to all of us at some point. And, and um, I had a couple, my father actually was uh, diagnosed with um, a pretty, 
serious form of blood cancer, multiple myeloma, and was given a very, very dire di diagnosis. And because you know, I had, I had always worried actually, like you know, if I have this anxiety issue, you know, when when something terrible does happen, will I fall apart? And so when he got this diagnosis, um, I found that I, I didn't. I like went right into sort of reporter mode and mm -hmm. you know, tried to, you know, we, we got all this data on who, which medical center had the best uh, you know, survival rates and, you know, well, he's the one who just went skydiving and spent 11 <laughs> years. <so. laughs> um, for, for people in the crowd who maybe have not had an anxiety disorder yeah. but have somebody that they know who does, mm -hmm. what has been the most helpful thing for you that loved ones have done well, to support you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing is just uh, un really, uh, and if, if there's one thing I wanted to do with this book is convey the notion that um, anxiety is not a moral failing. It's not... A weakness. It's an illness like any other illness. It just happens to affect the brain, and um, and so I think just you know being able, it, it's someone, a loved one, understanding that um, I think is is super helpful. Just come from that baseline uh, level of support and understanding. And then you know it really depends on the person because everyone's very different in terms of how they what they need when they're feeling super anxious. Like for me, when I have a panic attack, I like my husband to sit next to me and hold my hand. I don't want him to talk though. I, that I, I just just hold my hand, don't say anything. And but also also I find taking a walk. And I've there are many, many of my most of my close friends have had experiences of walking around the same block, you know. 10, 15, 20 times, just because there's something soothing about just that move, like a, a movement for me, and that helps me kind of emerge from a panic attack. But I think it depends on the person, and I think that's, you know, I think so. I think something, you know, someone could do for a loved one is just to say, you know, what, what it would be soothing to you in that moment? What can I do to, to help you get through this? Yeah. Is there something that people say to you or about anxiety that's really annoying that they shouldn't say? Um, why can't you relax? <laughs> yeah. Or you know, just take a couple deep breaths and you'll be fine. I mean, that, that just doesn't really cut it. Um, so, so, yeah. And also, and, and just this idea of that, that, you know, being anxious somehow means that you're sort of morally defective or something. Yeah. Because I do, I mean, no, I think that the stigma is definitely eroding. I think that, and especially I think among younger people, I, I've written a lot of stories about college mental health, and I'm just amazed by these, um, you know, a lot of young mental health advocates that are willing to have their name and their pictures in the paper and details about their mental health issues. And so I think, you know, that's going to go a long way to sort of erode stigma. You mentioned that that moment with the anthrax. Um, <laughs> do you... Do you feel like anxiety has helped or hurt your work, or both, as a reporter? I mean, that was certainly sort of a, uh, a not. The, that was a hurt. Yeah, that was not the <laughs> that's not my brightest career moment mm -hmm. there. Um, but but you know, weirdly, anxiety actually I feel like has actually helped my work too. I mean, being a reporter, as you know, um, often means you know writing on deadline and. And you know, a screw up can be very public. I mean, one one of my first stories for the Wall Street Journal, I have, was writing about this guy that I thought he said his name was Kurt. It was Canute, which I had never <laughs> even heard of. But you know, so I had to have a correction with this, and so so I you know. I triple check my spellings. I do more research than probably necessary just because I'm so afraid of messing up. And so that has been useful. Also, it's made me just more tenacious and, and um, you know, this, this anxiety about not getting the story. And there was a, st early in my career, I um, had this very, I did this, the, we, the Wall Street Journal used to have these little stories called orphans, and they were just, I mean, I did one on dog perfume. They were just sort of goofy, fun stories. And an editor um, had an idea for one. And he said to me, he said that he got the Sunday New York Times, and in this particular edition, he had salad dressing all over his paper. 
because it had been a promotion that there had been little packets of salad dressing, but the weight of the paper from the paper boy mm. slamming it on his uh, driveway caused it to explode all over the paper. Like literally, it was, I think it was Italian dressing, so there was like little bits of <laughs> Italian seasoning all over, all over the sports section. Um, and so he said, well, maybe there's a story in this kind of advertising promotion gone awry. So I'm like, okay. So I called the New York Times, I called the circulation department, and sure enough, the woman I spoke to said, yes, she'd actually had several, several um, complaints herself about this exploding salad dressing. <laughs> so I'm like, great. Okay, this is my, you know, this is, and I, I, was a, I, was a, I was a news assistant, so I was like the, the lowest on the totem pole, so I was, you know, really trying to prove myself. I said, okay, but the, only, but the thing is, I need to find someone besides this editor, you know, who had an exploding paper. And so what I had to do was I proceeded to cold call all this guy's neighbors, because I knew only certain subscribers had gotten, gotten the salad dressing during dinner. So the converse, conversations went something like this. Um, excuse me, do you get the New York Times on Sundays? Um, did you have salad dressing in your paper? <laughs> did it explode? <laughs> and you can imagine what kind of responses I got. I was yelled at, I was hung up on, I was cursed at, and, but finally, and so, but I was, I was like, I was, I was gonna get that story. And so four hours later, Oh my gosh. Some guy said yes, <laughs> and he became the lead to my story, and that that was a, that was a very bright moment. So yes, yeah, so so <laughs> of my of my career, <laughs> Greg Cowger with his exploding. He said he he. I, I think the lead was something like he would have loved to have tried Hellman's new Italian dressing, <laughs> if only he could scrape it off his newspaper. <laughs> so. It yes, helps. it has. It has. It has helped my career too. I would love to keep asking you questions, but I think these people would also like to ask you questions. So oh, we want to take questions from the audience. Just make sure you wait until the microphone is there because we are recording um, this whole event. Thanks, Joe. We have a mic here and in the balcony on that side of the house too. Please stand, or if you or you prefer, sit and just say your name and tr do try to ask a question. I know so many people have sentiments about this, but if we can ask as many questions as possible, and then we can meet Andrea and Morgan later in the signing line. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Wayne and Terry Lobdell, who are the event sponsor. Um, thank you wherever you are in the house. We know that you're here. Um, all right, let's go. There they are. Right there. Hi, my name is Diane. Um, Having a child is a major life-changing event. I was just wondering, how did your anxiety change um, after you had your child? That's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, I had a child who didn't like to sleep, so that was actually uh, a real, really tough because um, I find that my anxiety does kick up when, when, um, when I don't get enough sleep. But the interesting thing I found actually that in some ways, that my social circle or my circumstances had finally caught up with my anxious mind because it seems like it's socially acceptable and actually almost imperative for parents to be anxious. I mean, it's, it's sort of, I, you know, I would join these, I, I would go on these mom, mommy message boards and it was like, oh my gosh, you know, I think I gave my baby a BPA, a, a bottle that had BPA in it or, you know, this, I mean, so I almost felt like in a way, um, that finally my circumstances had, had kind of caught up with the way my mind normally worked. And um, it was actually, it was okay to be anxious now because everyone around me was. So um, in a way it was kind of heartening to, <laughs> to, to be surrounded by a bunch of other people that were all of a sudden anxious like I was. Who else? Do you tell people now about your circumstances? Are you open with, I have anxiety? Well, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> and so, and, and, um, before so, the book, were you? Before, you know, it's interesting. I, I had never, you know, we're talking about anxiety in the workplace. I um, had always clued in a couple close colleagues at work about my anxiety because I just felt like having an ally 
you know, was just really calming to me. But I never told my bosses. I was I was concerned about how I would be perceived at work. That not necessarily that. I mean, I knew I worked with very caring people, and I'd seen them rally around other uh, colleagues that had other kind of illnesses, not necessarily mental health issues, but cancer or other things. Um, but I was worried more actually that they, that out of kind of kindness or concern, that they might be worried about giving me too much work or that, that, that it would somehow affect the way they perceive my ability to, to, to do the job. So I didn't actually tell my bosses until I showed them the proposal for this book that my agent was about to go out with. So, um, but now, obviously, I'm, I'm, as I've been gearing up for the publication of the book, I'm quite open about it. And one of the most wonderful things about this whole process is actually you know, having people tell me about their own experiences with anxiety and you know, having uh, just starting a conversation about it. And because and, um, I think you know, by us all being more open, um, can really, you know, help others just feel comfortable, and and um, hopefully, people will be more willing to seek treatment, and and we'll all be a little bit. Pardon? <laughs> Question up here. Yep. So um, I heard you touch on the point that you notice um, discussion and discourse about mental health issues seems to be improving with the younger generation. Um, do you have any um, sort of, do you see any way to have more productive discourse between members of maybe the younger generation and the older generation who may sometimes see it as a moral failing and sometimes mm. find it a little bit different to have some common ground on you know, what a mental illness is, what anxiety is, and how it isn't a moral failing? Right. Well, I mean, I just think having those conversations and, and uh, um, you know, and I, I, I mean, I, well, first of all, I like your sweatshirt. I just had to say that. <laughs> Go blue. Um, but I think the more knowledge that's out there and the more conversations that we have with people, I think, I just think that that, that communicating and humanizing it, you know, saying, and I think more people coming out and saying, hey, I have, I have issues with anxiety. And, and it's, it's just one of those things that you know, when people are more familiar with it, it just, I think it makes it less foreign and scary and, and just, it just starts to normalize it. We have so, one over here. Yeah, keep talking about it. Right here. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Carrie. Thanks for coming. Um, and I have a question about whether you learned anything in the course of your research about the prevalence of anxiety as a co-occurring disorder, mm -hmm. um, particularly with developmental disorders, but also other mood or psychiatric disorders, and best strategies for treating you know more than one thing at a time, whether there's more prevalence of co-occurring anxiety disorders these days, Just anything in that realm. Yeah. I mean, anxiety and depression, in particular, often travel together. And actually, research is finding that anxiety is often um, a gateway disorder. So often, anxiety tends to, to show up first and raises the risks of later development of depression, also drug and alcohol abuse, and even suicide. So there is a lot of excitement around really targeting anxiety as a way not only because is anxiety miserable in and of itself, but because it could help pro possibly prevent these other disorders from, from occurring. But yes, they, they do often travel together, particularly, and, but, and also things like autism also um, is, is there, there's often uh, co-occurring anxiety with that too, and so there's a lot of research looking at around treating, how to treat both, because often, um, and even and also things like insomnia too tends to travel with anxiety as well. And what they're finding is that um, that that uh, treating treating both disorders tends to you know you, you tend to if you ignore one you tend to not get as great results ultimately from treatment. Hi there. Hi, I'm Molly. Hi, Molly. Uh, thank you so much for coming and bringing this subject up. And um, you're in a high-profile position, and so it takes courage. Well, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming. Um, so I'm curious about your experience with diet, or what your recommendations would be regarding diet and anxiety. 
Um, I mean, I just find in particular that, that you know, I think I was saying that all those kind of adult things that we all should be doing, like sleep, eating well, um, reducing stress are, are critical for it. I don't, I, had, I did not come across any particular uh, sort of, um, you know, studies that looked directly at particular kinds of diet for anxiety. So um, I think those, I think from what I understand that, that research is still in kind of fairly early stages. So um, I think there's probably, I'm, I'm sure there's probably more to come on that. We have one over here to your right, Morgan. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jessica, and uh, I myself struggle with, a lot with like anxiety, depression, OCD, ADHD. So it's real. I have a really long rap sheet of all this, and um, I my best friend actually, her mother has said to her on multiple occasions that she does not believe in anxiety. She does not believe in the majority of mental illnesses. And I'm like, I'm a prime example right here. Please just listen to me. <laughs> and so she has kind of been encouraging this person to like, oh, don't associate with them. They're a bad influence. They're just being melodramatic. And I'm like, to a certain degree, I can accept that because I am who I am as a person, but also not at all. <laughs> how, do you, how do you explain to someone that this isn't just me seeking attention, this is me wanting to avoid attention? <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, and I can empathize. I know that's incredibly frustrating, and I don't, um, you know, I think it's just something that we, like, I, I think as the as more of us speak more openly about what we're our issues and what we're going through, and just keep asserting that you know this is a real illness. I'm hoping that 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 will ultimately chip away at that kind of stigma. I mean, there's there's a lot of wonderful resources online too, like organizations like the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. You know, if if it's something that, you know, I don't know if you can slip slip some some of that into this person's <laughs> reading material, you know, cuz sometimes it's it, it maybe it, it doesn't if it's not coming from someone so close to them, you know that, that they might be able to, if they respect scientific research, you know. But keep fighting the fight, and and I thank you so much for for talking about it. We have a question up here, up here in the balcony. I just wanted to comment um, on a couple points that you made, but maybe also frustrations of anxiety. Um, having doctors wash their hands of you, that's, that's kind of a big one for me. I've had quite a few doctors that have, I feel, that have physically washed their hands of me, pass me along, keep passing me along. And then the other point would be um, the fear of um, what would it be to feel normal, that's a scary thing to me. I don't know what it is to feel normal. What is normal? So, you know, having to live with this the rest of my life, it's, uh, it's scary. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I can totally empathize with the, the doctors sort of not taking your concerns seriously. I think I mentioned that one doctor just did literally fire me. Um, and so, I. For me, it, I just had to sort of, it was trial and error to find, finally find like a primary care doctor that could really um, help me kind of distinguish what was anxiety and what was, you know, something that I need to pursue that was like a physical illness because, you know, the, there's so much, um, anxiety is such a shape shifter, you know, it really can, and it can be a whole body illness. Um, but then also finding a, a therapist that um, you can, you can connect with, and you know the the, the main sort of evidence-based treatments for anxiety are, are really you know cognitive behavioral therapy, and then also SSRI medication can be really helpful as well. Um, and then you know, I mean, if anxiety is you know can be a chronic illness, but I I really you know there are there are good treatments available, and if you haven't found the right one that works for you, I would just you know keep keep trying um, because I really do believe that, that you know, and sometimes it's, it's in combination that, that you've got to find the right kind of 
take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And there's a whole, I have a whole, several chapters on treatment. So um, if you're able to take a look at it, I, you know, hopefully maybe something will resonate with you. But thank you. Oh, I'm a little anxious. Um, so my question is kind of pertaining to the, the effect that nurture can have mm -hmm. on, yeah. um, I guess, a child's or an individual's propensity to develop some sort of anxiety disorder. Because you mentioned that um, there's some research that showed infants and I mean, four-month-old babies, you could kind of pre-diagnose if they were um, more disposed to something like that. And I don't know, is there research in that area? And kind of what does it point to if you've found something? There is research that. There, there's um, trauma in childhood is definitely associated with an increased risk of anxiety disorders. In particular, actually, um, illness in childhood. Uh, so even respiratory illness is linked. Like, actually, when I was uh, a couple, a couple times when I was very young, I actually stopped breathing because of um, uh, bronchitis. And the, my doctors were very, you know, my therapists were very interested in that. And it turns out there's a link between respiratory illness and um, later development of anxiety disorders. Um, also, uh, economic insecurity uh, in childhood is also associated with anxiety. Um, there's there's also uh, some some links between certain genetic profiles and so it's something called epigenetics, where it's actually the, the, uh, the interaction between genes and the environment that can also, so there's certain genetic profiles that if then trauma is put on top of that, people have a much higher likelihood of developing sort of PTSD. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's a lot of research looking, looking at that. Thank you. Um, we're gonna have two more questions, Fernando. For those of us that um, don't have any context as, as to what it's like to, to, to be you, is there any <laughs> advice that you could share with us that can help educate how we can better interact with those of our friends and family members that are affected by the disease? Right. Well, I guess, I mean, um, I think what I said before is that the understanding, understanding that, that anxiety is People aren't just being melodramatic or or trying to get attention. That it, that it is, you know, when it becomes a disorder, it can actually it can be quite impairing. And I think it's you know um, just communicating with the person in your life and be able and say you know what what can I what can I do to that would you know make you help you through this. I mean and and um, and and if the person doesn't know off the top of their head, then you know just maybe just keep asking. And it can be as simple as. Um, Getting someone to drink a water, or holding their hand, or maybe you know some people like when people talk because it actually distracts them, and some people don't like it. So I think it just just I mean I think just by asking that question, you've already shown that that you care, and that's that's a big that's a big thing for someone who's going through that. Okay, so and um, thanks. Good, and um, Mary. Hi, thank you for being here. Wonderful talk, as they all are. <laughs> Thank you for being here. But we, we have two adult daughters, mm -hmm. and they're great. <laughs> uh, when they were teenagers, I wasn't always so sure. Uh, however, <laughs> the youngest one, uh, when she was a freshman at the University of Michigan, the easiest child in the world, the one that was so ready to go to school, who had been dual enrolled, had done everything, had been high achieving, had been very mellow, really had, really struggled with anxiety mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, were lucky to connect with some wonderful therapists, mm -hmm. uh, great people, did cognitive therapy, everything was fine, kicked in again yeah. uh, when she started law school about five years later. Mm -hmm. uh, there were triggering events again, great, great people around her to learn great tools. She is in a great place right now and knows when <laughs> she may uh, need to do things. What I remember though, and I think my spouse would say the same thing, I felt body slammed when that happened to her as a freshman that, I mean, I, I to this, for many years when I would hear the ring on her phone, I would have that clutch of, <gasps> What's happening? <laughs> Is she going to be hyperventilating? And mm -hmm. I kept thinking, what could I have done while she was growing up? Or what, you know, were there signs? What, you know, was there something that we could do to have 
helped her avoid that as a freshman? Or no, does it just show up uh, during times? I mean, a lot of, especially things like panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder don't tend to crop up until about, you know, college age. So, um, I mean, there are certain things like, you know, but I, because I know my parents struggle with that too. They were, they were like, well, what, what could we have done? And, um, you know, I think sometimes it's just sort of the luck of the draw. And also, you know, and now in hindsight, I can look back and think, oh yeah, you know, I had that, I had a serious phobia of clowns when I was a little kid. And which, you know, clowns are creepy. Like, you know, what, <laughs> so, so, but now that I know the research, I know, oh, you know, a phobia in childhood does indicate that there's a higher risk of, of anxiety later on. Um, also, you know, I had these episodes of where I stopped breathing because of, because of uh, bronchitis. And so now I know that that was, but I wouldn't, I don't think anyone would have necessarily identified that at the time. And, and I wouldn't even have, you know, put piece that together unless I'd done the research before. So, um, I mean, it sounds like you've really been supportive and your daughter's getting the help that she needs. So I, you know, give, give you a huge hand for, for just, you know, doing that. Um, and really, one more question up in the balcony. Thank you, Ian. Hi, my name. Hi. Oh. Hi, my name is Audra. Um, recently, I've been going through a lot of like anxiety through different things, and like sometimes I'll get anxious from them. But like, I recently moved into a new foster home. And I feel like I'm bugging my parents by like having the problems that I do have. Yeah. And like, did your parents ever like feel bothered? Yeah, they did. I mean, I think they, well, they were also just so mystified. They didn't really understand what was going on with me. No one did. So no, I think it was incredibly frustrating for them, and that's actually a big re part of the reason why I wrote this book too, is for not just for um, people like you and me who deal with anxiety, but also for people who love us too. So I wanted something like, here, read this. You know, this is what this is. You know, how I feel. So um, I'm hoping. You know, that, so there, there is. You know, if, whether it's my book or something else, I'm hoping that you know that you might be able to. If there's something that that they might be able to read, that they could. Um, help understand because sometimes I think when they're so close to it when it's you know when it's a, a child or whatever that that sometimes it's it's easier to have it explained by somebody else um, but thank you for thank you for sharing that Are we... silence <laughs> <laughs> we could go on uh, uh, much much longer up here but um, but well, let's do that in the room at the book signing line, sure. where you can yeah. ask Andrea more questions. Um, please, a big round of applause first for Morgan Springer. You did a fantastic job. It's great to put your face to your wonderful voice on WIPR, so keep listening to that station. And thank you, Andrea, for being here. <laughs>